Who's Miss Karen? Just like a random woman is there. I'm like, where did she come from? Did the miss just pluck a random woman walking by and like put her there as a teacher? <laughs> What's good? Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of The News Olympian. My name is Mike Schuber. I'm the titular News Olympian. I'm a grown man who never read the Percy Jackson books as a kid. I read them as an adult to determine if they have been slept on by society. I said yes, and now I'm doing all the other stuff about the first five books before I get into Heroes of Olympus, and one of those major things is the Lightning Thief musical. I'm never on this quest alone, and joining me today is someone who you might know from various PJO social medias. It's Morgan Danielle, a.k.a. Imagine Matrix. Morgan, how's it going? It's going great. I'm so excited to be here. I am excited to have you as well. It has been a long time coming. I'm glad we're finally making the crossover happen. And what better context to be having the crossover than to discuss the Percy Jackson Lightning Thief musical, which is a fun one. And I enjoyed it. And I'm excited to see if we can get through covering all of it in one episode. I think we might be able to. Maybe. We might be able. We'll, we'll see how it goes. But before we get into breaking it down, just so the folks at home understand, what is your background with the Percy Jackson fandom? When did you start reading the books? It's Okay, I'm going to try and do like a truncated version of this. <laughs> yeah, we do have a musical to discuss. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So it is 2005. School year just started. I am nine years oldish. Yeah, because it's 2005. So I'm only like third grade. And I could not read in first grade. And I spent all of first grade like working really hard to read because all I wanted to do was read the chapter books that didn't have pictures because I just mm -hmm. loved the idea of that. My dad read me like Lord of the Rings. So I was just like focused on that. And by second grade, I was reading at a college level. Wow. So yeah, so I, I worked real hard. And so I just read all the time and I started wanting to stay inside during recess and they wouldn't let me do that to read. And then... They stopped letting me bring my book out during recess. And they're like, no, what? you have to go play. They wouldn't let me read during recess. That's wild. So it's 2005. It's the beginning of the school year. I started just kind of sneaking down to the library to hang out with Miss Treat during recess because she would give me all the good books. Turn recess into recess. Let's exactly. go. Exactly. <laughs> and I love talking to her. I still talk to her. She's so great. And also she introduced me to the series. I would go down there. I'd ask her for book recs, what she read over the summer because she would read a lot so she could tell kids what to read. And she's like, there's this great book that just came out. You're going to love it. It's about a kid. His dad's a god. And he goes to the summer camp. And I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't think that sounds very good. <laughs> she was like, no, you're not allowed to leave here without reading the first page. Oh, the first page hit so hard. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And I immediately borrowed it and I read it and I just, it's been my special interest as a neurodivergent person since then. So it's been almost 15 years. Oh no, almost 20 years of reading this book. Series. Almost 20. Yeah, if it was 2005 oh, to start, you're getting there. Yeah. So <laughs> since I was nine to now, and I actually, it was either between Lightning Thief and Sea of Monsters or Sea of Monsters and the Titan's Curse. I was allowed to make my first email account. And the first email I sent was to Rick Riordan. Yes. It was a piece of fan mail. And I got a response. Ooh. And he was like, hey, Morgan, like, you know, I'm not going to be near you for a book tour anytime soon. But I'm so glad to hear that you're, you know, loving the book series and excited for the new book. And then that email was part of my parents' internet plan, which they discontinued without telling me. So I didn't get to save it oh. because they were like, what sort of important documents did 10-year-olds have in their email? So oh, no. I will never get over that. That's unfortunate. I had a similar thing where I used to use an AOL account like for uh. the longest time, basically up until college. So I had a couple of things saved in my AOL account, like my acceptance into Rice University and stuff like that. And I had it like saved in a separate folder. And I figured like as long as I keep logging into my AOL account, like every now and then it'll keep it. Turns out AOL just like deletes your old emails without asking you. And uh, cool. I lost same thing. I had like a whole folder of like cool things. Uh, and now it's just like blank. Evil. <laughs> the worst. Well, that is cool that Rick did reply. And even if you don't have the actual email, you have the memory in your heart. Exactly. And 
That's fantastic. Well, great. I'm glad to have you on. Now, what was your history with specifically seeing this Lightning Thief musical? Have you ever seen a live production of it? Are you just a slime tutorial person? Where are you at? (laughs) So I did musical theater for over 10 years growing up. Hmm. That was basically my life. So, you know, I'm already into musicals. And when I found out about the musicals, because I knew about the it was like the initial workshop production that was like a 30 minute one act before they did off Broadway and did like a full. Right. I think it was like in 2014, there was like an off Broadway one hour thing that was like part of something where it was like multiple one hour plays. Yeah. And then it had another run after that. And then for the off Broadway revival, mm-hmm. it was fleshed out into the one we know now. Yeah. And then that U.S. toured and then that got onto actual Broadway. Yeah, exactly. And I remember trying to watch, I think there was like a video of the like original workshop production thing, whatever mm-hmm. it was. And I tried to watch it. The quality was just so bad. I couldn't focus on it. And then when the off-Broadway production was happening, I was like reminded, oh, this exists. Was super excited for it. I started listening to the soundtrack. Loved the song so much. Lots of them make me cry. (laughs) Um, So, you know, that's a good gauge for if I like something. Is Am I crying while listening to it? (laughs) And then they went on tour. And that was with the future Broadway cast. Um, I was looking at the dates and nothing ever comes to Denver except for now you are. Let's go. (laughs) Um, Exactly. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, of course, they weren't coming here. But I saw that on my birthday, May 10th, they were doing a production in San Jose. And I'm originally from California. I'm further south. But me and my fiance were like, hey, like for my birthday, can we just like go to San Jose and see the touring cast? And then I think we went to Disneyland after that. (laughs) Um, We drove down. Yeah. And so we went and saw the touring cast and it was awesome seeing it live and then you know i think they did a q a afterwards with the cast and you know chris mccarroll and kristen stokes and all of them talked about you know what it was like and and their own personal journeys and what they brought to the characters and their own experiences with the series i barely remember it <laughs> um, i was just too excited and then after that um a couple of years ago my fiance was in a local production of the lightning thief musical very cool what role he played Chiron and Poseidon. Super cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, he had a lot of fun. So I saw that production, five of the six shows, and I'm always mad that I didn't go see the sixth one. Oh, come it on. Was like, it was like the <laughs> second one I didn't go see, and then the rest of them I was like, yeah, I'm going to go see it again. So I've seen it about six times in person, including the tour cast, which was the Broadway cast. And then I've seen, uh, hypothetically, if there was a way for me to watch right. it Allegedly. from home, mm. you could say mm-hmm. that I would have watched it about 20 times. Allegedly, you could Allegedly. say the same for me. I tried <laughs> to be a whole good boy about this and everything. I got my library card. I went on to the archives and I was like, here we go, baby. Let's watch the thing. Because what I'd been told by many people, I don't think anyone ever specifically told me that like, this play is on it. But a lot of people yeah. are like, anything that's ever been on Broadway has an archival in the New York yeah. Public Library. And that's what I've heard too, is like, you yeah. know, they do archives of everything, but I, either not all of them are available or someone lied. I don't know. But I, I went to watch it. I was all ready to go. And then I couldn't. <laughs> it just wasn't an option. So I had to allegedly resort to potentially a tutorial of slime uh, <laughs> and and watched allegedly that in prep for this and for the interview I did with Chris McCarroll. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, you know, mm-hmm. yep. it's fine. And it got the job done. But I, I did my darndest. And you know what? I still, at the end of the day, I've got my library card and now having fun isn't hard. So at exactly. least there is some good that came from it. But yeah, it's weird that there was no official thing because it was on Broadway. Yeah, I mean, honestly, as someone who did musical theater and can rant for like several hours about accessibility in theater and Broadway shows. Yeah. Whatever. It's fine. <laughs> whatever you can do. Yeah. But I, what I will say to anyone, if you live in New York and you sign up or if you're just visiting New York because you can get like a 14 day NYPL Ooh. card if you're visiting. If you get a card, you can then go into a location or you might even be able to request the thing online and then the next day you can watch a video of a thing so like me for example like i have not seen a couple of plays like they were here and then gone before i moved to new york so i might just like watch some archival of stuff so that's pro what tip I would do. for anyone coming through New York. But we are here to discuss the Lightning Thief musical, which may or may not be in the archivals and on YouTube, and you might be able to find it. But to preface all of this, 
I am not a traditional musical enjoyer. So if I have any critiques, it is because I do not like this format of thing. <laughs> but all of that is to also say I did enjoy this for the most part. I like the parts that didn't feel just like standard, like I'm going to talk about my feelings songs. And overall, I enjoyed this, but it isn't like I don't think I'm going to be watching it 20 times. Yeah, I would watch fair. a super cut of just the parts where only Chris McCarroll singing because <laughs> that guy can sing. Oh and I'm God. not trying to diss the rest of the cast, no. but it is. As I said in my interview with him, it is apparent that he's the only one who did Broadway beforehand because he is just like a cut above. And that's well, not a knock. It's just he's really talented. Yeah. Well, and on his TikTok, he I don't know if he still does. I haven't I don't use TikTok that often, but he would put up these like really incredible like vocal advice and vocal training videos about like how he warms up or how you can safely do certain things or how you can work towards stuff like he's just very knowledgeable about voices and how to use them well mm -hmm. and how to use them in a way that you sound good and you don't you know jeopardize your health yes no he seems super knowledgeable about it just from the chat that i had with him mm -hmm. and yeah he really knows his craft so let's get into the musical itself we have the opening song, and I don't know, like, the titles of any of the songs because I didn't do, like, the deep dive of going <laughs> through the... Uh, I can name them. <laughs> wonderful. I just, like, wrote them about, like, what what kind of words I heard. Yep. So I, I wrote, first thing in minutes, opening song is a pretty good recap. And then in quotes, God's are real. They don't pay attention to you, especially if you are their kid. Yeah, well, <laughs> so, I think it's called, like, the gods are real. Oh, perfect. Nailed it. What I always say, too, is it's like a perfect introduction before you mm -hmm. get into the story. Like, it's about kids and their parents are gods and the gods suck. <laughs> I like it. It felt very much like when you read or see a Shakespeare play and they kind of have like the opening sonnet that's like, here's what's going on, guys. Yeah, and exactly. I think it did a great job of that. I love Percy entering with the knee slide. That's very oh, fun. So good. It's very cool. We then get the look I didn't want to be a Half-Blood song, which mm -hmm. I think is a perfect way oh. to truly kick things off given how the book starts. And I just wrote in my notes in all caps, this dude can sing. Like, yep. <laughs> he's very talented. He's really, really, really solid. Super agree. Yeah. And so many lines in this whole thing, like it's Joe tracks, like they're all directly from the book or like approximations of what the book right. said. And like, there are so many songs from this. That if I'm trying to convince a Percy Jackson fan to like listen to the soundtrack, this is one of them. It's a little long, but it's like mm -hmm. you listen to it and you're like, oh, OK, this is Percy Jackson. It has great singing. It has all the stuff I wish I was in the movie if, you know, the show hadn't come out yet. So it's such a good intro and it's so fun and I just love it. Yeah, it transitions then into the field trip and then this is kind of like your classic sort of like it's a song that feels like it takes 12 minutes because they intersperse like a oh, yeah. scene <laughs> inside exactly. of it. But they're at the field trip and what I appreciate about this is the whole play, and it makes sense given its roots, but it feels very much like if you've ever seen the play Puffs, where it's very like a down-to-earth sort of like production, like no flashy things, like the risers are scaffolding. Oh yeah, yeah, that's like, as someone who did musical theater, like my favorite productions these days and like the last few shows that I did were all like the kind of more low-key, minimal costumes, minimal sets, and it's just about the people and like how good they are. There's like another show like that called Peter and the Star Catcher. I'm not, I don't oh. think it's even a musical. I think it's just a play. But it's based off of another, you know, middle grade book series I liked. That was a prequel to Peter Pan. And it's a wonderful play. It's just like that sort of production where they're not trying to awe you and overwhelm you with like big sets and big costumes and stuff. They're like, I don't know. It just feels more intimate and fun to me. And like yeah. you can use your imagination. Right. I like it. I think for... When they did it in Puffs and when they do it here in Percy Jackson, I think it does work because if you are going to go like the magical route, you either have to be the Harry Potter play where you have yeah. like incredible effects and like a theater custom fitted for your show to work. Yeah. Or you have to go this route. If you go in the middle, you're going to get into uncanny valley territory. and It's going to be bad. Yeah. That yeah. being said, I see why this show didn't do well on Broadway because if you don't know what's up and you buy a ticket to this for your kids and you go – Parents are going to be like, what the heck did I just pay however much ticket prices are for? Like, yeah. this is incredibly low budget. But I also understand, like, 
by talking to Chris and learning about the history of it a little bit, it's just like this was never planned to be a Broadway show. It just kind of mm-hmm. happened. It got so lucky. what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. So I don't really necessarily hold it against the play. I just mm-hmm. can see why it had very positive reviews yeah. and then it got to Broadway and then had like universally negative reviews. Like I get it. But that's also Broadway with most shows that are directed to teenagers. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. The fancy Broadway critics, they're not going to see shows for teenagers. Mm -hmm. They're going to see, like, the most dramatic, artistic thing you've ever seen in your life. And then they hate things that are made for children, essentially. Totally. So, yeah, (laughs) this is not me to say that, like, I think it is bad. It is just, like, I see why Broadway didn't Mm -hmm. like it. But I still think it's fun. But I think this sort of production, like, certainly works better in an off-Broadway setting because you're kind of going into that already being like, okay, you know, like, I'm already at a stage that's not necessarily Broadway, blah, blah, blah. And then you're in, you're like, oh, but I still think that they do a really cool job with some of the things. Oh, yeah. So notably, like when they're here and you have the Mrs. Dodds fight, like the transition oh. for Mrs. Dodds is pretty cool. It's very fun. And the sword pen transition, like, yeah, you see yeah. how they do it, but it's still fun. So I like those sorts yeah. of things. I do feel like that style works a little bit better with Puffs just mm. because it is a parody. And because Puffs is like more, like it's still a love letter to Harry Potter, but it's definitely making fun of it and stuff. Oh, yeah. And I feel like this Percy Jackson musical doesn't get as far into that territory. Like it's funny, but it's not like poking fun at the thing. And it's not yeah. like a full-fledged comedy like Puffs is. I feel like you get a, even more leniency for the low production cost look when you're more of a parody yeah. as if it was like a real thing. But I still think it works. But it's not like blow you away amazing kind of thing. And it's not like 100% a perfect fit. I think I'm like, I'm just so used to like lower. Mm -hmm. Like I've just, I watch so much community theater. Yeah. That like, I love when I see bigger shows with like minimalistic stuff. Right. But I also, I also like the big spectacle too though. But like, I don't know. I thought this worked really well. But like, I also understand also being like, I wish they did like a little bit more or like. Yeah. Like, I still like it. And what I love and appreciate about it, and this is something that, like, was actively planned, is, like, a thought for this show is, like, if we keep it simple, people across the world can do it. And it's not that hard. And schools can do it. And local theaters can do it. And I think that's awesome. Like, I want more places to do that. And that's, like... A cool thing about even when you think about Hamilton, like their set is super simple. I don't know what the rights are of like doing (laughs) that in a school and blah, blah, blah. But as far as just like the production of putting on a show like that, like it's a pretty simple set. So I agree. I think there should be more accessible plays where the only thing you got to do is focus on like the acting. And it doesn't matter if you have moving staircases and rotating this (laughs) and rising. You know, not everything has to be Hades Town (laughs) with the up and down floor and everything. That was such a good show, though. Oh my it gosh. is super I cool. Got to see it's a it really good one. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful. It rips, but like you're not going to do that in the middle school. Oh yeah, no. <laughs> unless you take some drastic changes. So they continue the song, and you get like a little more of those theater kitty things that I necessarily don't love, like more of the talking in between, and then the, <laughs> and again, uh, I know this criticism is like a me specific thing. It's it's, <laughs> and I I hope people like understand that. Like when I have opinions and stuff on the podcast, like. <laughs> It's not the definitive thing. You can a thousand percent disagree with me on everything. If that's like you didn't like the TV show and I did like, I just enjoyed it. I had a good time. If you disagree, that's okay. And on the flip here, if there's things I don't like, but you like it, that's okay. I recognize this is just like a personal taste thing. But like some of the jokes, this also just feels like classic theater kitty type stuff yeah. is the like, it's not actually a joke. Someone just said something in a funny tone and you think it's a joke. <laughs> so when Mrs. Dodds just goes, Kronos, and there's like a musical beat, like that's not a joke. She just said yeah. the word Kronos differently. And I always thought that one was kind of weird because it's not in the version of the song that's on the soundtrack. Oh, interesting. She doesn't cut in like that in the soundtrack. It just, Chiron keeps talking. Mm. Yeah. I would have liked that better. Yeah, that one, I don't know. I don't know. It always threw me off. (laughs) Okay, good. Okay, but it's, it's that. But what I will say, I love... I think it works for Chris's voice. I think it works for the play. The fact that like most of the music is like rock style, like oh, yeah. actual drums, guitars, stuff like that. It's so cool. Yeah. I love a rock style song in a play. And I think it works incredibly well for this show. 
And I think they nailed it. And I think that made it more fun. Agreed. And <laughs> if it was more of your standard issue sort of musical sounds, <laughs> I would have like stopped watching. But like I still enjoyed this play throughout. No, yeah. There's just parts of it that I was like, all right, I wouldn't mind this song ending a little early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm super curious to learn which songs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll get into it. I think not too long. Um, but going on, you have Mr. Brunner and he's explaining stuff a little bit. I love this guy who played... Mr. Brunner and Chiron, his deep voice <laughs> so is fantastic. Funny. Oh, he's so, so good. Funny. He's so good. Mm-hmm. I, I really appreciate it. Agreed. I he's think very silly. he nailed it. And then you have a little bit of like Grover and Percy bonding in the Met and they get interrupted mm-hmm. by Mrs. Dodds. One thing I found interesting is that they keep some things from the movie version, not the book version. And the first instance here is that Mrs. Dodds is a substitute. Yeah. Which is just like, it's such a throwaway thing. I guess they do use it as a joke where she says, I know so much about you. And Percy says that's, that's very... really dedicated for a sub. Yeah. And that is a funny line. But it did just make me think like, why would they keep this in? I understand why they kept that because... Honestly, if you think about it, like the one thing about probably not the one thing, but one of the things about the first book that bothers me so much is after like he, you know, slashes up Mrs. Dodds and comes back out and everyone's like, who's Mrs. Dodds? And and Nancy Boba Fitt's like, I hope Miss Care like punished you. And he's like, who's Miss mm-hmm. Care? And just like a random woman is there. I'm like, where did she come from? Did the miss just pluck a random woman walking by and like put her there as a teacher? <laughs> like, and so having her be a substitute and then having it so that she's just like, they just didn't have that other chaperone makes so much more sense to me mm-hmm. than like just a random woman being there <laughs> now as yeah. a new teacher. I get it. I get it. I I guess I was okay with it because it just made me think like, wow, the mist is like really powerful. But I can see it from a perspective of like, okay, what does everyone think happened? And yeah, who is this other person? That's a good question. Like that was something I asked like as an adult rereading it where I was like, okay, hold on. Who is this woman? (laughs) (laughs) Like, is she like a random nymph that lives in Central Park? And like, showed up to help out or yeah no that that is look it's a very good question so percy gets expelled it's a very on brand to how he gets expelled in the book which i thought was nice Mm -hmm. and then we have percy at home at sally's and one thing i love just about the broadway casting like it's just they do the thing where it's like seven people and they do all the different roles Mm -hmm. so percy's mom is just played by a black woman and nobody cares and i love it like i very much appreciate just the like whatever she's the best for the role she's going to do the role who cares she's so perfect Mm -hmm. she just like totally encapsulates just i want her to be my mom in this (laughs) (laughs) i did really like her i feel like my favorite three people from the cast were her annabeth and percy they were really strong i like the chiron guy i think he's a good like comedic relief character like he's a great like bit role and i think he works quite well Mm -hmm. but yeah those four people i think really really did a solid job yeah so then smelly gabe enters again (laughs) just like big theater over the top energy not my not my favorite to quote unquote jokes or just him saying bean dip really loudly yeah. which is like it's not a joke if you just say two words loud yeah. uh, but they do make him an ample jerk so that you root against him quite quickly because I don't yeah. know if this is in the book where Sally says she's saving up for night classes for creative writing and he makes fun of her for it does he say that in the book I just reread the book and I don't think they address that but like she does want to take night classes and Percy like does say she like wanted to go to college and be a writer Mm -hmm. um and she later takes night classes and that's where she meets Paul Mm -hmm. so I think it's nice just having that little added tidbit of character where even if I don't think she talks like it's something that Gabe knows about or talks about in the book you have that extra thing where you know that she loves something and want like has goals even if you aren't privy to what the full goal is and then you have you know this guy being a jerk and picking on her for something she loves yeah yeah i think it just very much establishes her character which is Mm -hmm. good it ramps up the gabe sucks so they are at least establishing that which makes sense yeah and then sally kind of gets into a backstory about percy's dad this is kind of like the montauk stuff oh yeah this song wasn't my favorite because it did feel a little bit just like your textbook sort of like here's your story song (laughs) like it just felt like too easy of a choice let's sing a song about who you really are in the early portions of the play not my fave I generally, like, I'm someone who, you know, I love all kinds of music, but generally in musicals, like, I like the upbeat, fast ones rather mm-hmm. than the slower ones. And I still can, like, appreciate the beauty in some of the slower songs. Like, there is, you know, Tree on the Hill in this musical that's just, like, heart-wrenching. Um, and I understand, like, you know, because of how musicals work and how you tell a story, like, there are certain 
beats and certain kinds of songs that are in most musical stories. Um, Howard Ashman, who worked on like Little Mermaid and, and produced a lot of movies for Disney, like he says, there's always an introduction song that's like Bonjour from Beauty and the Beast. And then you have an I Want song, which is part of your world or, you know, Good Kid. Like there are just these songs. It's kind of like the hero's journey except for in musical theater. Yeah, you get your standard tent poles. Yeah. Yeah. Strong. It's just, you know, there is a classic. You have, you know, his parental figure encouraging him. And I think for Percy Jackson, it makes a lot of sense too, just because it's a series and story for kids that feel like they're weird and they're different and, you know, might not feel good about that and then just having a song with a parental figure even if i feel like a lot of kids skip this song on the soundtrack probably (laughs) it's there if they want it sure by the end of the song i did write that i like that the song is about how being weird is good it's a play for kids it's a good message to have even if i don't necessarily love the style of the song i liked the message of the song and there are some funny things in there like i like when percy says about poseidon not coming home for dinner yeah he sounds like a real winner like there's Uh. still some funny moments in it too and god christmas carol can sing yeah god his voice is just angelic really really but in like an edgy way when you think yes. the edgy songs mm-hmm. so good it's fun i i loved him so again like not my fave but i still think the message is good and i yeah. get it it's there for a reason <laughs> yeah Sally's going to send Percy to Camp Half-Blood then Grover shows up in satyr form and he's very frantic and <laughs> this is again and like i'm sure this guy's a nice person But whoever played Grover Mr. D, easily last place in the cast for me. Aw. And I don't know. Jarrell. Like, seems like a nice person. It could just be, like, the nature of the roles. Like, it might not even be him. It might just be, like, the Grover role is to be, like, very frantic and afraid so he's yelling. And then the Mr. D role is that he's supposed to be angry and he's yelling. But he just felt like his acting style, whether it was his choice or not, whatever happened, the acting of those two roles was just volume. Yeah. And I just, to me personally, not my fave. Yeah. Jarrell was one of the actors who came in during the tour and the Broadway runs. Mm-hmm. Off Broadway was George Salazar, who is the voice you hear on the main songs on the soundtrack, the bonus tracks they recorded after the fact were Jarrell. And George Salazar, I think, was a really good Grover. I didn't dislike Jarrell at all. I thought Jarrell was also a very good Grover, just in a different way. They both bring very different energies to Grover than I felt in the book. Jarrell, I think, actually has been on, like, the Hamilton tour cast for, like, a oh, few years now. Cool. Yeah, yeah, he does some cool stuff. But, yeah, I mean, like you said, you have opinions about musical theater. It's not necessarily mm-hmm. your go-to. Right. So, you know, those are the certain characters that I can get, like, even if you have the best actor in the world doing them, the way that they're played— Sometimes, and the way that they're directed to play them just doesn't jive with everyone. Yeah, to me, it felt very much like when I saw the Harry Potter play, when it was still two acts and stuff. I think Mm -hmm. I saw it in like 2018, something like that. It felt very much like Scorpius Malfoy, where that role is just like he's supposed to be like awkward and like talk too loud and stuff. And I didn't even like that. And again, it's like, I'm sure this actor's fine. I'm sure it's just like, I think it might just be me personally, where I don't like the thing where it's just like, like, I don't know. Not for me. I still did like when he was Grover when there were different parts. Like, Mm -hmm. basically, anytime he was Grover and not yelling, I thought he was great. I thought the energy was there. I thought that the friendship was there with Percy. Yeah. And I think, like, singing-wise, also totally fine. But, like, when he got into the, like... I'm so frantic that I'm yelling kind of stuff wasn't my favorite. And then Mr. D is just like yelling the whole time, which Mm -hmm. feels like a choice made by someone. And again, (laughs) that just like isn't what I enjoyed. Yeah. I think because Dionysus is such a small part in the overall show. Mm -hmm. I get them just being like, be angry the whole time. Be like up, up, up. Because theater is also like as much energy as possible so that people in the back can understand and see you. And and I think, you know. Yeah. If you're in the front or if you're seeing like a totally hypothetical recording, like, you know, and you're closer, (laughs) you know, sometimes you're seeing things that the people in the back aren't even going to notice. Yeah. So then when 
they are trying to go to camp, they get attacked by the Minotaur. Mm-hmm. And the Minotaur looked really cool. Oh, so cool. Loved. However they did the Minotaur, like the lighting worked well to make yeah. it kind of hard to see exactly what the props were. It, yeah, it was like a big puppet. Mm-hmm. But it was awesome. Yeah, we were pretty close when we saw it. It's so cool. And like that's the part of the minimalist stuff that I like where they're not trying to make some like hyper-realistic Uncanny Valley thing. But mm-hmm. they have it be a little bit more than just like a guy in a mask, which is what they did for you know my fiance's production because they were like we need to make it accurate and so they toned down a lot of like the silly stuff and which you know he wasn't very happy about being in it he, he they wanted him to be chiron but like completely like straight face like they didn't want him to be as funny oh i, th- I loved him as like more of a light-hearted comedic relief exactly. especially for the play there's not like that much like straight up funny yeah. characters so i loved what they did with chiron yeah and i love chiron being like comedic relief and not being relegated to being like the straight man in scenes mm-hmm. and so he was my fiance was like let me be funny. <laughs> Please let me have fun. Come on. <laughs> yeah, I just I love things that look cool and aren't that hard to execute. Yes. Yeah. So that was really fun. And I also love that every time Percy does the pen to sword transition, yeah. or at least two for two, he yells sword out loud, <laughs> which is great. And I feel like every iteration of Percy should do it. Like, I feel like in season two of the show, when he goes from pen to sword riptide, he should have to yell sword. Like, it's great. I think it's fantastic. I also think it's so interesting that every iteration of The Lightning Thief has it so that Percy still has Riptide when he fights the Minotaur. Yeah, but the book, he doesn't have it. That makes so much sense to me. But also at the same time, it's like, well, I guess because they all truncate like the Met and Mrs. Dodds to Mm -hmm. Montauk, like you're not having those several months. It makes sense that he wouldn't necessarily, he would like still have the pen since it's all happening so fast. It would make less sense that he still has it while he's at ENC for a few more months before the end of the school year. And then it's like, oh, he just never used that pen. (laughs) Right, right, right. Yeah. Totally. And then after the fight, I did love this moment where I think Grover is saying, don't pass out, don't pass (laughs) out. And then he passes out. And he has this dream sequence, which at this time I was interested and confused as to why they were doing it but then yeah seeing what they did with the second act i got it poseidon shows up and is a bit goofier and He's says like what belo- yes and says what belongs to the sea can always return to the sea and then pause it's a seashell and gives a seashell <laughs> to percy fantastic that later kind of replaces the pearl thing which makes sense but at first i was like this is very early to yep. give percy what i think is going to be the stand-in for the pearls interesting yeah. and he's like oh look a strange man in a hawaiian shirt like, he's like yeah, this is it's so really weird good. what's happening <laughs> <laughs> so then you get the mr d scene not my favorite um Wait, oh, but yeah. but like the end of that dream sequence when Annabeth comes in yes, and like yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like, oh, my gosh, this is like and he's, you know, delirious because he's waking up from a dream and he's like, oh, my gosh, this is the most beautiful person I've ever seen. And she's mm-hmm. immediately like, oh, you drool in your sleep. It's, it's so great. good. It's great. They nailed it. They nailed it. So, yeah, we get the Mr. D scene. Not my fave. But we then have Chiron transitioning to being a horse, which just involves him getting out of the wheelchair and putting in a pretty big <laughs> horse tail into his pants so- and. And then prancing around while walking, A plus, A plus. I have like the most weird story about that. Uh, Okay. So one of my friends who's a cosplayer and YouTuber, she made like a walkable centaur butt where basically Mm. it is rigged. So she straps onto herself and then as she walks, the back, the hind legs move too. And it's basically balanced on her, but it looks really cool. Mm. I shared it and it was before I saw the tour cast and I like added the Lightning Thief Twitter. And it was when Mixed Thief uh, Ashley ran it. Mm -hmm. And I think she like commented or was like, oh, wow. And when I tweeted that I was going to go to the San Jose show, she was like, did you bring your friend Centaur butt or something like that? (laughs) (laughs) Because I was like, does the Lightning Thief do this in the musical? Do they do a walkable center? But if they don't, I know someone who can make one. <laughs> <laughs> but I also love just the comedy of him standing up and just having this big horse tail. It's and really nothing funny. Nothing else on the way he acts it. It's so good. It's really good. So we get a little Chiron and Percy learning session. We then get the Percy and Luke introduction session. And I really enjoyed that. I liked the dynamic between Percy and Luke. Yeah. I think they make Luke a little bit more obvious that he's anti-God, which I think is fine, kind of given the direction the show goes in and, you know, kind of make it a little shorter. Yeah. And 
Grover comes back. He's still kind of being a little frantic and stuff. And then we do get a Luke and Annabeth scene. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting for me to see this after seeing the show where we don't really get the whole Annabeth Luke crush thing. It was fun to see an actual representation of that because the movies didn't do it. The TV show didn't do it. But now the Lightning Thief musical does have kind of Annabeth being a little flustered around Luke. And it was fun to like finally see that for once. So Mm -hmm. I did appreciate that quite a bit. I can write essays about Annabeth and Luke's relationship in the books and all sorts of opinions about it. And like, you know, it's not that I don't like that it's there and it's not that I like that it's there. It's just I have a lot of to say about what it means that it's there. And so I do like, you know, obviously these are adults playing kids. So there's also not that age different stuff that you would get from the book. Mm -hmm. So also it just feels, you know, they've known each other a long time. You get her being a little flustered around him and like you get that they have a, this sort of relationship already. And it's this show does such a great job of streamlining things and getting the information there in a way that is not only efficient, but entertaining. And like, I feel like it flows really well throughout yeah. the whole thing. So that's just like in another little thing that gives you a lot of information, but you you don't feel like you're being like unloaded on it. <laughs> Totally, Mm -hmm. totally. Yeah, I think it worked. Now, the next scene is Capture the Flag. Before we get into Capture the Flag, though, we're going to take our mid-episode break here, the lightning brief. The lightning brief is back as we cover another thing with Lightning Thief in the title, and then we will get into the continuation of this play after the break. Hello and welcome to the Lightning Brief Musical Edition, Shubio Edition. I have two fun updates for the podcast for you. First, we've got a fun stream happening on March 30th at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. This stream will be me and Robert from the Damn Meme page going through the script of the Lightning Thief movie. Fun fact, the Lightning Thief movie script is just on the internet. And also, fun fact, apparently, some things in the script were deemed so bad that they weren't brought into the film. So what we've done here is Robert has read through it and highlighted every single portion that was in the script but not in the movie i have not read them yet and robert will be reading those to me on a stream and you will get to see my live reactions we'll talk about all these scenes and that will be the stream it will be available to anyone who is at any tno tier of the patreon so at the five dollars a month and above tier just head on over to the newest olympian.com slash patreon to join that's also where you can watch it and if that day or time doesn't work out don't worry because it will have a replay with the live chat replay and everything and even if you are listening to this way in the future or if you want to join the patreon way later down the road you can watch it it will always be up on the patreon so as long as you join a tno tier over at the newest olympian.com slash patreon you can watch this very fun stream that we're doing on march 30th that is a saturday and it's 4 p.m eastern time the other fun update is you may have seen on social media we teamed up with a local coffee company in Minnesota, Straight River Coffee, to create some TNO coffee. It is called Anna Clues Roast. That's right. You can get this wonderful coffee, which comes in a wonderful reusable bag with incredible artwork by Ava Hess that has a pigeon drinking a cup of coffee with TNO branding all around it. If you want to know more about the coffee, it is specialty grade coffee made from Brazilian fair trade beans. It's got caramel flavoring. The flavor notes are nutty, caramelly, and chocolatey. And the bags are also from a small career owned business, Lionsgate Designs. And I think we've already sold out of the pre sale bags where I signed the first 100, but we're also going to be making coffee for all of my my other podcasts. So you can get signed Potterless ones in the near future, signed meddling adults ones in the near future. So stay tuned for those. But the coffee also comes with free international and domestic shipping. So when you see the price, it's all included there. They have a decaf option available and you can get it either whole bean or ground. So to get that, just go to the newsolympian.com slash merch and then scroll down and you'll see the thing for the coffee. But yes, you can get Anna Clues Roast right now. You can support a local business. All the people that I've talked to with it are really nice. They're all listeners of the podcast, which is really cool. And we have teamed up to make this happen. And I'm so excited to have this partnership hopefully go long into the future and as far as i'm concerned they're the official coffee of the new olympian and will be forever so i'm super stoked about this partnership head on over to the new olympian.com slash merch and get you some anna clues roast today also just an update if you enjoyed last week's episode and you wish you could have seen what the video call we did looked like well you can go to the tno youtube channel and watch it thanks to kelly for making wonderful backgrounds i put together a video with pretty backgrounds and stuff and it's more of an unedited version it's a pretty lightly edited version so if you want to see what it really was like 
chatting with Chris, you can go to the TNO YouTube channel and I will be doing more video versions of some past things and some future things there. So make sure you subscribe to the TNO YouTube channel. I would appreciate that. Just search for Newest Olympian or you can go to youtube.com slash at symbol newest Olympian. Now, earlier I talked about the Patreon, so I want to give a shout out to the folks on Patreon. And I would also like to alert the folks on Patreon. I know one of the patron perks is ad-free episodes, but I think the coffee is so cool that it's not really an ad, <laughs> right? I think it's it's such a it's the one time that I'll do it before the ad kind of stuff. But if you go to the newsolympian.com slash Patreon, you can get access to a whole bunch of bonus stuff. I recently put up a bonus episode where I did every single question that was submitted in the recent live stream that we did. So there's cool stuff up on the Patreon all the time. If you are on the Patreon, you would have gotten early notice of this coffee promotion and you would have had a head start on getting one of the first 100 pre-orders that came with a signed bag. So cool stuff on the Patreon, but I want to give a shout out to the folks who have joined the Patreon most recently. So shout out to our newest Super God Tier patron, Georgina. Shout out to our newest God Tier patron, Michael Lalali, And shout out to our newest Demi God Tier patrons, Orion, Tim, Libby, Mylin, Nordly, and Dybel, Kaylee, Sarah A., and Jasmine. And shout out to Sebastian Sawyer, who upgraded to the Mega God Tier status and shout out to Sarah Elise Arnson and Bella who upgraded to the Ultra God tier status, the producer level status, meaning I'll be saying their name in the ending credits of every episode. Thank you all so much for your support. May Hermes bless you that if you are ever playing a video game or a board game or a card game that involves stealing, that he helps you steal stuff. You know, God of Thieves. Now, if you're all caught up in the newest Olympian and you're looking for a new podcast to listen to, I make a whole bunch of podcasts. I'm an independent podcast boy, and I think you would enjoy the podcasts that I make. And one podcast that I make that I think you'll enjoy is Potterless. Potterless is a similar podcast to the newest Olympian, but it's about the Harry Potter books, and I made it before I made the newest Olympian, so you can see and hear my growth. So you can hear my growth from hobbyist to part-time job to full-time job podcaster, boy. It's a fun adventure through the books. And also, if you want something a little more 18 and up, you can listen to that because I made that an explicit podcast. So there's curse words galore. So head on over wherever you get your podcasts and search for Potterless or go to our website, PotterlessPodcast.com. We recently put up an episode from an old live show where Kelly and I did a wizard on Survivor with a bunch of fun characters live in Philly. And that was a good time. So yeah, check out Potterless. It's good. Now, unless you are listening on Patreon where you get ad-free episodes, you're going to hear some words from sponsors to make it feasible for me to be a full-time podcaster. Some of those ads will be read by me and others of them won't be the ones that aren't read by me are inserted locally. So if you live in South Africa, don't be surprised if you hear an ad in Nebedali, Petty, Sotho, Swazi, Sangha, Swana, Venda, Afrikaans, Josa, Zulu, and English. Apparently, there are 12 official languages of South Africa, and I apologize if I messed up the pronunciation of any of those, but don't be surprised if you hear an ad in any of those, or maybe more, because according to Wikipedia, at least 35 languages are spoken in South Africa. But once those ads are complete, we'll get back to this episode of The Newest Olympian. And we are back. Capture the flag is beginning. Clarice is here, of course. Clarice is very into it, which I think is a fun bit. Like, as a bit character, Clarice is great just to be, like, over-the-top mm -hmm. action. Oh, so I love her. that is fun. When Annabeth then enters, Percy says, you're my dream girl. I mean, uh, the girl I met when I was dreaming, which feels like a very Percy line, even oh, though fun, it wasn't yeah. actually pulled from the book. So Perfect. it was well-written. Yeah, and him doing, like, the lightsaber stuff with yes. the sword. Mm -hmm. One thing I noticed is, like, when I listen to the soundtrack, Chris McCarroll sounds like he's playing an older teen, almost. Mm. And then when I watch the show, it feels like he's playing, like, a little bit of a younger teen. Like, he feels, yeah. like, more of a kid. And I just thought it was really interesting because, you know, they recorded the soundtrack before they even were, like, on tour and, and doing all that. I don't know. I just It's really interesting. I wonder if that was, like, a specific choice where he went in and did, like, an older teen kind of vibe on the soundtrack. And then, like, you know, some of the things when you compare how he says lines on the soundtrack to how he does in, like, the eventual tour and Broadway show, it's just, like, a slight character difference that I really enjoy a lot. I really liked how young and, like, innocent while also still, like, having a hard time and being seen as a bad kid yeah. in the show. I liked it. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I like the way he did it. We talked about that a little bit, and it was just him kind of being true to what he felt the character demanded rather than yeah. a particular, like, I'm going to do it this way kind of thing. And I think he absolutely nailed it. Annabeth then comes in. She explains the ADHD dyslexia stuff, and then then she also explains that her mother is Athena. She accuses Percy of being sexist because he had asked, who's your dad? Uh, and then Percy replies, no, I love girls. I think they're nice. I think they're 
nice. <laughs> so good. Such a good line. No, I love girls. I think they're nice. <laughs> Annabeth says they capture the flag is about proving glory. And then Percy goes, okay. And then turns to Luke and says, she's a little intense. Which, <laughs> uh, the vibes are great. I love it. And I love having these three different, I guess four if you count the movies, but mm-hmm. three different versions of Percy where I feel like the book one is like a little snarkier. This musical one is a little more like lighthearted, sillier. The movie is the movie and then the TV <laughs> show is like still the sass, but not necessarily, the right I would say vibe. closer to the, oh, did you say not the right vibe? No, not the right kind of sass in the movie, I feel like. In the movie or in the TV show? In the movie. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the movie, like, I don't think there's any sass. Like, he's no. just, and it's not Logan Lerman's fault. It's just, like, the writing, he doesn't ever tell a joke. No. Like, they don't let him be funny. But in the TV show, I feel like the sass is more along the lines with the book where it's a little, like, snarkier. I yeah, feel like I agree. Percy in the musical here is, like, a little sillier and a more, yeah. more like the I'm the only normal person here which mm. is like fun in in a theater performance to be like yeah. what's going on like a little more of that exactly. so i i enjoyed it a lot i also would be very interested to hear people who made complaints about the show for having too much exposition if they have the same complaints about the musical Literally. because you, you know what happens in this musical it's exposition city the whole time and i still think it's enjoyable <laughs> well, and joe tracks who did the musical also wrote for the show like right. i think he's great at doing like here's a lot of exposition and here it is in a way that still moves the plot forward. Mm-hmm. I do think there are some places, even though the musical is much shorter than the show, obviously, I feel like the musical yeah. does have some places where it does that a little bit better. But that's literally just because of the medium is so different. You kind of have to. Yeah. Like, I think and I wonder if that's why people wouldn't have those complaints. It's like, A, it's shorter. So they like cut it more slack mm-hmm. where I was already cutting the show slack because it's just, yeah. you know, eight episodes that they're trying to keep short. But I also wonder if it is an accepted thing of musicals where it's like, well, in musicals, they talk about what they're doing while they sing. So, yeah, (laughs) but I've had that same thing where I'm like all these, you know, a lot of people complaining about it's too much. It's they're going too fast. They're cutting too much. They're doing too much exposition. I'm like, but the same people are like, oh, I love the musical. It's the best adaptation. I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I don't I wonder if there are people out there like that. I would assume like most listeners of the News Olympian, I think just like don't have that issue. I think it's in other places, but I would be interested to hear if there was someone who was like, I think the show had too much exposition, but I do not think the musical did because then you are a hypocrite because this musical has lots of exposition. I think it's fine, but interacted. Yeah, I've interacted with people who are like that. (laughs) Wild to me. Wild to me. Yeah. So something I do think is interesting because the musical has to do this just like the show I felt had to do this with you got to shorten some stuff because you only have so much time. Yeah. They combine the distract Clarice plan and the Supreme Lord of the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And I think it's great. I think it's so good. Yeah. Like if you're doing musical, why would you have two different confrontations with Clarice Mm -hmm. that essentially end the same way with her just getting drenched or, you know, ending up in water, her getting beaten. So I love that. And I love how they also flow into, you know, the campfire song and Percy's claiming after the song rather than after this moment. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was really interesting. And I think that's just a fascinating element of adapting the book into different mediums. mm -hmm. You have to do some things and it feels like a fun challenge that you have to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed the way they did it here. Just Mm -hmm. exactly what you're saying, like bringing those two confrontations together and then going right into the song about about basically like who the heck's my dad because we still want to get some of that emotion we haven't gotten enough of that yeah so you get that which also teaches us about offering to the gods we also learn about some of the other characters gods and what the other parents are like it's a very efficient yeah. portion of the show and i really enjoyed it yeah and and about this part where you get the exposition about her running away and mm-hmm. percy being like what and <laughs> The Campfire Song is one of the other songs that I show people if I want to try and convince them to listen to the soundtrack because it's catchy, it's upbeat. Mm -hmm. You have those character moments that are great for TikToks. So people (laughs) are like, oh, yeah, like, I love this. I've heard this on TikTok. (laughs) Um, So, you know, it's it's one of those things I think is light and it has the character information and people who've read the books and maybe on the edge of maybe I want to listen to the soundtrack, maybe not. That's one that I show people and then they're like, oh, yeah, I'll listen to it. Yeah. yeah. But before that, we do have like a capture the flag song. Yes. I like the vibe. Very rock and roll, which fits the Cleary's character. Mm-hmm. I think, again, it's just like it's tough to have 
songs. I feel like Chris is easily the best singer. I think Annabeth is pretty solid too. And then everyone else is like a little below. Not that they're bad. I think it's just that those two are like a step above. Mm -hmm. So it is tough when you have songs where it's like those people and then other people singing and you're like, can we go back to Chris singing? Or like, oh, can we go back to Annabeth singing? (laughs) (laughs) I adore those two, Mm -hmm. same two people, their voices. Because Kristen, I think has been with, she was with the show since the inception of it. Like that's really cool. It had gone through the whole thing. Um, So she was the one cast member who had done every iteration of the lightning theme. That's awesome. (laughs) Was her. Um, She was always attached to it. Um, I think I also, I don't think it was the show I went to. I think someone was saying that the show they went to, the performance they saw, um, the actress who played Clarice, when her and Annabeth are like facing off and singing each other's faces, she like leaned forward and like gave her a kiss on the nose, like Annabeth, (laughs) (laughs) and like ran away. (laughs) The energy of that is so funny. That's good. That's good. That's good. So yeah, they're singing these songs. There's fight choreography, which mm-hmm. is like fine. I, I fine. you know, it's it's very like it's silly. And, yeah, very silly. And then something that I think is silly but great is when Percy does go into the bathroom, he rolls across stage on the toilet. I asked Chris about this, so that's been a whole discussion, but it's so good. Uh, And then you get Percy and Clarice one-on-one, and the way he conquers her is by, you know, opening the toilet, and then someone sneaks behind with a leaf blower with with a roll of toilet paper on the end, and that is how he defeats Clarice. It's so good. It's such a fun, like, that's the perfect kind of low-budget effect. Like, it's so funny. It's great. But still impressive. The production that my fiance was in, for some reason they wanted real water, but it was oh, a small no. it was a small community production. Oh. And so the real water was just like little like just it was like a spray bottle on like the the stream setting rather yeah. than like and they had like it just it it was people were like laughing so hard, not for the right reasons. Mm-hmm. Whereas like the toilet paper thing, like it's funny. It is more impressive, you know, when they shoot in the audience, it's like fun because it's like, oh my gosh, they, you know, shot toilet paper in the audience. Right. Like, it's just fun. You get the gist and it's better than just having a little spray bottle. A thousand percent. You get to use your imagination, which is fun. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a great time. So the campers come in and Luke is there. Annabeth is there. Luke asks, you know, what happened? And Percy says, I had an accident. Great. And then Luke says, all hail Percy Jackson, Supreme Lord of the Bathroom. Fantastic. Love that name drop getting in there. (laughs) Percy and Annabeth then have a slight argument about the plan. And I think the actress who plays Annabeth is just absolutely killing it with the vibe like she's perfectly nailed the annabeth vibe especially when you have the line where percy goes i could have died and she says the plan would have worked either way like that is just the perfect dynamic the two of them uh the two of them are great i really enjoyed the two of them it's so good it's so good i'm just you're right just perfect percebeth dynamic Mm -hmm. and so efficient again in like setting up their relationship yeah a little bit of like there is some sympathy there like But then also you get some of her exposition of why she needs a quest so badly. You get her being like, oh, wait, if you controlled water, never mind. I got to go. It's good. Uh, I love it. Mm -hmm. Them fighting a little bit. Right. Exactly. Annabeth asks, how did you beat Clarice the Beast? Which is a fun nickname anyway. Mm -hmm. And (laughs) Percy says, the toilet responded to me. (laughs) Which felt very much like I became one with the plumbing. Well, yeah, exactly. (laughs) So then we get the campfire song. It's a good angsty song. It fits the rock vibe. I liked Mm -hmm. it. And what's great is they're all kind of like one upping each other of who has the worst parent. And then Mm -hmm. Chiron comes in and all he says is my father is Kronos. Remember my lecture. He ate his children. And then doesn't finish the rhyme like leaves it unresolved which is perfect and then Luke just goes yep Chiron wins (laughs) yep oh my gosh and then the actress who plays Sally is Selena is so funny Mm -hmm. and her verse just the idea of Aphrodite just hanging out in her demigod mortal daughter's house Mm -hmm. and like feeling her dates is such a strange thought Oh, I know people always comment on the um, back in another terrible day, which we skipped over because he didn't like it very much. Oh, yeah. I just really didn't, <laughs> really didn't like I it. I think that song's so funny. So I, I always listen to it. But there's the whole part where Selena comes in and was saying that Charlie Beckendorf started growing sunflowers mm-hmm. and people are always like, he would never. My whole thing, total tangent, I think that Mr. D being the god of drama is trying to start stuff and... <sighs> 
Yeah, the that's, that's the vibe that I got too. Yeah, the nymphs just had a crush on Charlie Beckendorf, Charles mm. Beckendorf, and just mm-hmm. wanted that. And he's like, no, they were totally holding hands <laughs> and just starting stuff with the teenagers. I for sure took this as Mr. D just hates the kids. So he's just mm-hmm. saying the thing that will make them the most upset. So, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think that tracks. But yeah, I just always see people upset about that. I'm like, look, Beckendorf would never. And here's no. why. <laughs> I, yeah, I always thought it was Mr. D lying. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> Again, got a drama. Come on. He even says it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the campers encourage Percy to get up and sing. He first starts singing a pro Sally song and someone says like, he's doing it wrong. Yeah. And then he goes yeah, into, your godly <laughs> he goes into doing basically an anti whoever my dad uh, is song, yep. which is uh, great. It's super cute. So and unfortunately, the Luke and Percy friendship is also very cute. They've done it again. Ah, <laughs> I know where what? it goes. And yet, I'm rooting for them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> How dare they? Every time you're like, God, I love Luke. And then uh, you're like, oh, God, no. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought the guy who played Luke did a good job. I think the vibe of Luke and Percy was was really solid. He's so charismatic. Like, mm. And, you know, we're probably not going to get to that part in Act 2. But yeah, like his, I, think, I think this will be an uh, Act 1 only episode. Yeah. <laughs> but I just have to say his reprieve of Good Kid in the second mm-hmm. act at the mm-hmm. very end. Oh, my gosh. Like chills every time. It's so yeah. good. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. So Percy gets claimed. He is very excited about his dad being Poseidon, which is such a great contrast to <laughs> yeah. A, him acting like he doesn't care before. And then B, no one else is excited because they understand the larger implications. And he's like so yeah. A giant fork. <laughs> yeah. We cut to Percy, Mr. D, and Chiron talking. I did enjoy Mr. D in this scene. And th- mm-hmm. I guess this is the problem is like if you start being angry at 11, when you get to the point where you should be angrier, I feel like it doesn't have that same earned feeling. Yeah. But Mr. D should be this angry at this point. So I feel like I I was not bothered by how angry he was here. And I thought it was really funny when they bring up that Mr. D wanted to turn – Percy into a dolphin from the get-go yeah. and how if he was a dolphin, we'd all be safer, which is just great. Oh, I love it. It's such a good conversation. So good. They do then explain the whole Zeus, the big three thing. It feels very true to the book with like, these are the things that Chiron tells Percy. We then get into the whole lightning thief thing and we get a great line from Mr. D where he says to Percy, you can't fake being that stupid unless he's a brilliant actor and I'm the god of acting. So I can tell you that he's not great, great, so great. Good. So good. They also get something, and I wonder I wonder if this line was different in other iterations, because we get a fourth wall break when they're talking about the Master Bowl. Yeah. And Mr. D says, we're not talking about some tinfoil zigzag from a Broadway musical. I feel like that joke lands better if you say a tinfoil zigzag from an off-Broadway musical, but the alleged video that I allegedly watched uh-huh. was of the Broadway recording. No, yeah. Was that line different? Like, when you saw it on tour, did they say something else? I'm trying to remember, because I had something about that line, too, because... I think it is different. I have the script in front of me, actually. Oh, nice. Here we are. They say Broadway musical in the script because this was released at the Broadway musical. I think on tour, they either said off-Broadway or from like a tour of a Broadway musical or something. And then when my fiancés casted it, they, of course, said from a a community college production of The Lady Thief. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I know people do mix it up. I feel like the version I saw, I don't know. I feel like there was a version that said high school production or something like that. I don't know. I don't remember. But yeah, they do definitely change it up depending on, you know, who's performing it. Yeah, I feel like that joke lands a little bit better if it's not on Broadway. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So Chiron instructs Percy to go to the attic and speak to their mummy. Percy asks if he means old person for mom and Chiron says no you got to be brave and then just to be perfectly Chiron says if you fail the gods will be at war just perfectly raising the stakes Uh. the oracle then sings the prophecy something I thought was interesting is that they changed the words of it to say dangerous lord Mm -hmm. and then they rhymed it with restored I think about this all the time because in the book it says god who has turned and see it returned and it may have just been to make it flow a little bit differently I think because if you say god that is turned in the book that implies Hades Mm -hmm. and it actually means Aries. But then when you say treacherous Lord in the musical lyrics, it implies Hades, but means Kronos. Mm. I just think it's interesting that they changed that implication. Yeah. The other thing I do enjoy is I always, and maybe it's just because I did improvised hip hop stuff for years, but I always feel like rhyming turn with return is like kind of cheating. Yeah, Like that's not, tough enough so i like rhyming lord with restored that's better i do like that line better and honestly like 
rip to every other version of Oracle scenes, the book, <laughs> the show, the movies. This is the best version of the Oracle giving the prophecy. Yeah. Like it's really cool. Oh, it's, it's really so cool. Good. And with like the hands. The and- hands under that's the best part because she's in this dress and she's higher up, so she looks larger than life. And then it's perfect because they do this and, and her dress is moving, and you can tell it's just people underneath her dress moving their hands, but then they immediately transition out of it. Yep. And it's the crew kind of sitting around talking to Percy about the prophecy. And it's such a good transition that perfect. it feels almost impossible to do on the stage, let alone on like a low production stage. Uh, this particular part of the play, I was like, that's incredible. I loved that. It was awesome. Uh, I love good transitions like that. She just goes off and like the dress comes up off of them mm-hmm. and they're just all sitting around and it goes yes. right into them being like, okay, so here's the prophecy you just heard. Uh-huh. Let's discuss it's incredible. it. incredible. And then like that coupled with a perfect lighting change just truly makes mm-hmm. it feel like you wiped. It's ah. Oh. I love really it good. so much. And just I the, loved it. The singing of the song. Oh, my God. Okay. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah. No, that, that particular actor, she was so good because she's Sally. She's mm-hmm. the Oracle. She's Charon later. Yep. She's Selena. She is great. She uh, was really, really great. She's Echidna for the bit moment. Right. For three seconds. Yeah. <laughs> So Uh, everyone assumes that the prophecy is about Hades, true mm -hmm. to form. Percy is then sent on the quest. And the next song is Good Kid, which slaps. (laughs) This song is great. I feel like this is like the song from the music. Oh, my God. At least to me. My takeaway was like, this is the song. Absolutely. Yep. That uh, I, I love this song so much. And it makes me just like cry if I listen to it at the wrong moment. <laughs> like, yeah. Or the right moment, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just like any kid who grew up neurodivergent or from a hard background or queer or Bullied. I feel like any kid who has ever felt like they weren't good enough or like they are getting in trouble for things that weren't their fault or they're being unfairly blamed. Like it's the epitome of what I think is so good about the Percy Jackson series, which is mm-hmm. it is for any kid which is pretty much all kids who have ever felt like they are being just pushed to the side by parents and adults and people never listen to them. And it's, you know, saying you are worthy of being listened to your opinions and your feelings matter, your parents ignoring you or your parents being absent or them expecting you to be them. Like you don't have to become them. You don't have to, you know, I just, I love it. And this song uh, I love it. I, I yeah. can't describe how much I love it. This is the only song that I was like, I got to listen to this one on the soundtrack because I just want to hear how Chris did it where it's the like perfect we got to nail this song mm-hmm. kind of approach. So I feel like that's the one I'm going to listen to because it's just going to be great. So Luke and Percy then have a one-on-one talk. Luke makes it clear that he didn't love the quest that he went on. And what's very funny is when Percy is talking about the prophecy and says mm-hmm. that he'll be betrayed by a friend. Luke does this like big wide eye to like look to the side, just yeah. making it so obvious it's just, well, that it's him. Oh, huh. not always clear what the prophecy is. Uh, yeah, they're super vague, dude. Uh, it's so funny. Yeah. So I thought that was good. Percy then resolves to take on the quest after Luke brings up that Sally might be in the underworld, which mm-hmm. definitely feels true to at least how the TV show handled it. Mm-hmm. And then we get the we're going on a quest song quest. with Grover. Yeah. Again, this is another one that just kind of felt like your sort of boilerplate. Like, <laughs> like when when the song started to begun, I hadn't looked at like what the time in the alleged video recording mm-hmm. was, but I was like, I bet this is going to intermission. <laughs> like, it just <laughs> yeah, very much it's felt like song. it felt like we're going to intermission mission, yep. which is fine. But speaking of intermission, that is where we are at in the show and we are just at about time for this episode. So that nails it. But, you know, it's one of those wonderful problems. Too much fun stuff to talk about. Got to break it into two. Uh, everyone is probably happy that we're getting more musical stuff because I know people love the musical and I see why people like it. It's a fun one. Even if it's not 100% my cup of tea, it's still a real fun watch mm-hmm. and I've enjoyed it and I've enjoyed talking to you about this first act. So Morgan, thank you so much for joining. This has been wonderful. Yeah, thank you. It was so fun. I knew I was going to just go on tangents and that's what happened. And I'm okay. not ashamed Look, of that. <laughs> no, you you are welcome. I'm the mayor of Tangent Town. I handed you the key to the city and <laughs> we had a wonderful time here. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in Denver at the Denver show. I guess by the yeah. time people hear this, that will be in the past. So, you know, past tense time for everyone else yeah. listening. <laughs> but if people enjoyed you on the pod and they want to hear or see you doing other stuff, where can they check you out? Yeah, um, I'm Imagine Matrix 
on most social media. It's Imagine without an E and Matrix like the movie. There you go. It's not where I came from. Um, I'm a cosplayer, writer, occasional actor. I do a lot of Percy Jackson content. I'm planning more Percy Jackson content in new mediums, hopefully soon. Nice. And uh, I run a... Percy Jackson Discord server specifically for fans over the age of 18 who just want an adult space for adult fans who just talk about stuff, just really chill. And uh, it's fun. We just hit 500 members. So very cool. Fun stuff. Well, thank you so much for joining Morgan and listeners. Thank you for listening. And until next time, when we cover act two. Until then, we'll see you later. Hi, thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Newest Olympian. This podcast is created, hosted, and produced by me, Mike Schuber. I also run the social media and the website. Our editor is Sherry Guo. The music is by Bettina Campamanes and Brandon Krugel, and the art is by Jessica E. Boyd. If you enjoy the show and you can't get enough, you can head on over to thenewsolympian.com slash Patreon, and you can get access to a whole bunch of bonus content. You can also find us on social media. We're at Newest Olympian on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and there's a subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash The Newest Olympian. If you want to support the show with some TNO merch, you can go to thenewsolympian.com slash merch. And if you want to see if we've got a live show coming to a city near you, head on over to thenewsolympian.com slash live. I mentioned that Patreon earlier. Let's give a shout out to our producer level patrons, Kelsey Gillespie, the damn Steam Nuggets, Vicky Garcia, Veronica Bartova, Frida Vikstrom, Megan Moon, Craig McRoberts, Taylor Payne, Sabrina Balsiger, Boney Pony, Polly Burge, Nikki Harris, Tatiana Schmidt, Sandra Rose, Josh Sayer, Josh Wilkie, Abby Ryan, Ashton Gabrielson, Marco Redhouse, Sam Sam Reby, Riley Kiddes, Mrs. O'Leary, Milo Kim, Santa Kopf, Julia Kendall, Rick A, John Drillsmo, Rayla Matthews, Luna Kadoon, Sky Mallory, Per Sassabeth, Aiden Parziani, Biggest Tyson Fan, King Bastion, One Damn Distraction Coming Up, Ginger Spurs Boy, A Cup of Solace, Meg Roy, Olivia Krinicki, Bradimus Prime, Kibo Guy, Skylar Sisters, Demigod Nurse, Zachary Hamilton, Scott Sheldon, Sophie, Natani Page, and M. Thayer Cohen, Finley McLeod, Sarah Elise Arnson, and Bella. If you want to support the show in a non-monetary way, word of mouth helps the podcast so much. Whether you reach out to someone directly and say, hey, there's this podcast called The New Olympian. It's about Percy Jackson. I think you would really like it. Whether that person is a Percy Jackson super fan or someone you're trying to convince to get into the books. You can also just talk about the show on social media. That helps. You could even just leave a rating and review on whatever podcasting app you're using. All of these things really help. I appreciate everyone who has already done so, and I appreciate anyone who will do do so in the future. But I'm just so thankful that you tuned into this episode, and I hope you tune into our next episode, where we will be joined by Ashley Latimer, aka Mix Thief, who ran the Lightning Thief social media to discuss Act 2 and the social media management of the Lightning Thief musical. But until then, I'll pursue you later. Hey, so it's me, ASMR Make. So I'm a big knuckle cracker. I like to crack my knuckles a lot, and I don't think I've done it in a little bit, so I think I will have some crackly knuckles. If you don't want to hear that, you should skip ahead. But for this segment, I'm going to just see if cracking my knuckles will uh, come through in the audio. Oh, there we go. Felt pretty good. All right, uh, thank you so much for listening.